so welcome back to Sandy's Spooky Spectacular Reviews. So the second board game I'm going to be talking about is Betrayal at House on the Hill. Now I played this game once so far and I loved it that much I instantly had to buy it. It is a fantastic game that I cannot wait to play again but unfortunately it takes at least an hour to play so you kind of need that time put aside. And I haven't had time to force my group back together yet to play the game. So I really love this game I can't wait to tell you more about it. So this game is for three to six players. There are six characters that you can play and they change how you play the game. It's also a tile placing game. So if you're not a fan of tile placing games, I can understand they can be quite lengthy, but this one's worth giving you a chance. The other game, Subterra, I reviewed is also a tile placing game. Originally, I wasn't that into tile placing games, but these two are absolutely fantastic and have definitely changed my mind on these games. So I highly recommend checking it out if you're into something different. So you place tiles and you move basically. So this is where you're starting. So you've got your entrance hall, foyer and grand staircase. This goes into your upper landing and then you've also got your basement landing. So when you are placing rooms, you want to do them on the level that you're on. So each tile will have either ground, upper ground, basement, upper ground, basement, ground, basement, upper basement, upper. So as long as you are placing the tile that matches the level you are on, that's all fine and dandy. It doesn't matter what the room is as long as it's the same level and it matches up to the doorway. So this is the ground level. So this is a ground card. You just match the doorway. So this is your kitchen. The kitchen's pretty simple, but it gives you an omen card. So then you pull an omen card, which I will get to very soon. With omen cards, you can also have event cards, which are represented by that symbol, or you can have item cards, which are represented by the ball symbol. So for every level you have, you have a tile card for that level. And based on what you can do each turn is determined by your character speed. So you have these characters to pick from which have super cool miniatures which I'm so glad came painted because I cannot paint little miniatures to save my life. I do not have the delicate small fingers for that skill but they are really cool little figures and each character comes with a character profile but the character profiles are double sided so you can change through which ones you want and shake it up a little bit. So they look like that. They are double sided. So when I played the game, I played the character Flash. And I actually really love this character because his speed is six, which means you can do six things each turn. So you can move, you can place tiles, you can use items. Um, but yeah, you can move up to six, which I think is brilliant because there are some that can only do, where is it? That one's four, four, this one, three. He can only do three. So it's a very, very big difference on what you can do between three and six. It might not seem like it'd make that much of a difference, but it really does when you need to escape the traitor. So they're the cool little figurines you have, they're your characters. Each character has their speed, might, sanity and knowledge. Speed was my favourite trait but the other ones do come in handy. Especially your sanity can be affected the most. So on your turn you will move and you will place rooms. So for example when you place a room this one will give you an omen card. So your omen cards can 
give you items and things that you are able to use later. So generally you will read them and then keep them in your possession. This also determines whether a haunt will begin. For every card you have, you always have to roll the die and the number has to go above. So if you only have one omen card, all you have to do is roll above one. So it gets harder as you go because the dice that they give you have a low blank sides and they only go one and two. So you always have to roll six at a time, but there is times where you get, say, four omen cards. You simply have to roll above four, which sounds easy enough, and then you get all blanks. So they are omen cards. You read them out loud, you keep them in your possession, and they can come in handy later, but they are what controls the haunting starting. So they are represented by the little bird. They are probably the most common one you will come across, as well as event. So event is with this little swell, and these cards look like that. So your event card you will read out and act instantly. So this one is, whoops, you'll feel a body under your foot before you can leap away from it, you're knocked over. A giggling voice runs away from you. Turn over all your item cards, not your omen cards, and shuffle them. The player to your right randomly discards one of them. So it can be something like that, or it could be, debris has fallen from the ceiling. Roll a die and find out if you take damage or not. So there are your event cards. They are very common in most of the rooms. The one that isn't as common as I thought it was going to be when I was playing and really need it is an item card. So your item cards are represented by the ball. Some of them are simply just items that you may need in the haunt. They may come in handy with just like the little traits they can help with. Or they could be weapons so when the haunt happens you can attack. When I was desperate for a weapon to kind of protect myself because the traitor was next to me, I got smelling salt, which is probably one of the most useless things you could get in the game. And it was kind of frustrating. I'm like, I really want a weapon. Um, but there's other things like you've got, where is it? You've got an idol, which can be used for the haunts. You've got adrenaline shots, um, amulet, angel feather, armor. So there's all different items that you can come across. So you always breathe them out and then keep them in your possession. So they are some of the things the rooms can give you. Other rooms can also have kind of abilities that they force you to do. So for example, this one is a pentagram chamber. When exiting, you must attempt a knowledge roll of four plus. If you fail, lose one sanity, but keep moving. So this is where your other stuff comes in handy. So this knowledge, while he is incredibly fast, his knowledge is very small. So he only has three knowledge. So you must roll above four, and then if that happens, Oh, he loses sanity, he doesn't lose knowledge. Um, but his sanity is only on three as well. So if your sanity goes down to zero, it's kind of death. So it's not a great thing. You don't really want that to happen. Um, so while his speed is great, he can lack in other areas that other people may not have an issue with. So that is some of the rooms. There's other ones which um, give you a coal shoot. So this takes you to the basement straight away, and then you have to find your way out of the basement. You have a mystic elevator, which this is my favorite, because I was getting chased by the traitor, and I was basically a dead end. I'm like, there is no way for me to escape and get downstairs to my friends and complete this haunt and get away from them until the elevator showed up. And it was perfect timing, and I got to escape from them, and it was brilliant. And this is my favorite tile ever. Um, and then the library also comes in handy. Once per game, if you end your turn here, you gain one knowledge. So if your knowledge is at one and you're worried about it, run to the library and stay there. Um, I can't believe my luck of just randomly picking these tiles. <laughs> I just grabbed them out based on the thing. And they're actually really handy tiles to explain. 
Um, so they are great to come in handy. Basically when you're playing the game to start off with, it's very slow paced because you're just placing the tiles, you were just picking up the cards, you were just reading the cards. Um, but then when the haunt starts, that's when things become very, very interesting. So obviously with your item and omen cards, you keep in your possession. Some of them you can trade, otherwise you can drop them and other players can pick them up. This will come in very handy information when the haunt starts and people need the items that you have. So when the haunt starts, they are revealed by kind of this haunt chart, which is shown in this book, I believe, I think. No, not that one. It's shown in this one. So you have three different books. So this is your haunt chart. So basically it goes by what room you were in i'm not sure how we can see that so what room you're in and what omen caused the haunt to begin that you failed the role with that will then reveal who the traitor is and what haunt you will play so the traitor will go off with this book and they will read the campaign so just opened up to the center so it might be voodoo they will go off and read that campaign into a separate room and come up with what their plan is and what the book tells them to do. The other people will read this, which is Secrets of Survival. So they all have the exact same inside. Of course, this opens to a different center, so that's kind of annoying, but <laughs> all right. So the center of this one is Pay the Piper, whatever. Um, so it will tell them how to survive, how to get away from the traitor, how to go away from the haunt. So survivors read this book, traitor reads this book. You read them separately. You do not let the person read in the same room. The traitor should also have the rule book so they understand what monsters can now do because monsters have different abilities to what they did as a human. So it's important for the traitor to understand what they can do. So when they read the book, the other players will read the haunt. Everyone will understand what they have to do, come up with a plan. Everyone then comes back to the room. You announce it like we're ready, come back. Don't just wander back and then you might overhear something. It kind of ruins the experience. You complete the steps that say right now. So every campaign will have what to do instantly, you all do it. And then do not share your plan. So don't start talking about what you have to do in front of the traitor because then then like, well, I know what he's about to do, I can cut you off and stop you from doing it. So try to have it memorized and have the book in a location that you can secretly reach if you need quick reference. Just don't let the traitor like kind of get onto what you're trying to work out. This can be difficult the first time you play it. The first time I played it, luckily my colleague already knew how to play this game incredibly well. And she was very understanding with us being a bit slow trying to understand it. And she let us take our time and she was just, she was incredibly helpful and we would have been lost without her. Um, so thank you so much, Bucky. Um, but yeah, she was great and yeah, it was definitely helpful playing the game with someone that's played it before and letting you work out those bugs slowly. So with the campaign we played, essentially she was this ghost that wanted to be remarried. And because I was the closest person to her, she decided that I was going to be her husband and the other two people were close to the corpse and had to get the corpse and the item to the church. I then had the ring that I had to get down to them, which thankfully the elevator showed up. I could jump down to them and get away from her. But it was just a funny campaign, especially it's great playing with people you can joke about with. Because I'm like, I don't know you, I have commitment issues and ran away. So you can throw in your little jokes to make the haunts even more fun if they start to get scary. But that was a campaign I played and it was really fun and sometimes you can feel kind of trapped and then other times you just pull out a lucky elevator. Um, but now you can attack, you can die, so players can die. 
if that happens they are out of the game and all their items have dropped so other players can come pick up their items but the monster can't die so this is why it's important for the traitor to understand what they can do because they cannot die but they also cannot enter any new rooms um other people can still place new tiles but the monster cannot um they also get new abilities they ignore harmful room text but they can use room text that benefits them they can choose not to be hurt by cards um so they have like all these little different tricks that's really cool and so it's important for them to kind of get to know the rule book as well um another thing they can do their speed changes so they are able to move quicker there is also another aspect of the game where you have a hidden trader. No one really knows who the trader is. Um, I haven't played this part of the campaign and it's not very straightforward in the book, but I'm interested to know how the hidden trader works and hopefully she may have played it and can I can play it with her and get to know it a bit more. But it's extremely fun just playing the campaign in general. The fact there is 50 campaigns in this book I think is brilliant because no game will ever play the same because you're playing with very different people, you're playing with de very different characters, room tile placing is always random, always different and then you will never play the same campaign or if you do it's still going to be different. There's 50 campaigns, the chances of you playing the same one over and over is very slim but it can always still happen. Winning the game, each campaign, each haunt has a way to win. It will tell you how to win. So the campaign we had to do, the survivors had to get the corpse, the ring, and the ghost down to the church. And so we made to do that, but you obviously weren't allowed to kind of announce because the corpse was in the basement we were on the ground I was in the upper level so I had to try and get the ring down to them and they had to get the corpse from the basement up so it can be very challenging when you've done it the first time and you're trying not to give away what you're trying to do in front of the traitor but it's a really fun game and if you're looking for a horror aspect coming into Halloween um or just something new to try this is a fantastic game when I first looked at it and was going into it I'm like this sounds way too complex and I imagine right now you're like yeah this sounds too complex and too big for my liking I beg you to reconsider it is a beautiful made game and there is an expansion as well which is incredibly cheap for expansions the board game itself costs $74.95 so it's probably a reasonable amount, but if it's the first tile game you're playing, you might go, oh, is it really worth it? But considering the campaigns and the amount of times you could replay this game, it'll always be different. Even if you want to purposely pick which campaign to do, as long as you don't read it in advance, I'm sure it would even work that way. You still got 50 playthroughs through this game. Like that is still pretty great value. And then the expansion is called Widow's Walk. So that adds 20 more rooms. This adds a roof and 50 new haunts again. So that's 50 more campaigns. And that's only for $39.95, which is probably one of the cheapest expansions for any game out there. I haven't yet bought the expansion just because I want to play the campaigns in this so far. But the fact that I work at a game shop and pretty much see it every day, I'm probably going to cave before Christmas if we're being truly honest. So I understand this game can sound super complicated and at first I was very I was very put off about playing it just because of the length and you need a kind of bigger space to set the tile places out because they are a nice decent sized square. But just it's really fun and unique. If you know someone that owns it, ask them to show it to you, borrow, have a games night with them, or even just flick through the rule book. Don't read ahead in the campaigns because they will spoil it for you. 
But once you understand the rule book and understand kind of the gameplay of it, it's so much easier. Um, yeah, I highly recommend checking it out. It's one of my new favorite games I have found this year. I found a lot of new favorite games this year, and I'm going to be talking about another one in my next review for board games. While it does have a learning curve to it the very first time you play it, it is definitely worth it. Um, yeah, so thank you as always for watching my reviews. Please let me know what you think of this game, and if you have a favorite campaign, try to avoid mentioning spoilers just because other people might not be interested in the spoilers, but I'm happy to look up the campaign and discuss it with you. Um, but yeah, thank you for watching. Um, let me know what you think of this game if you've played it before, even if you hate it, just let me know why. And yeah, I'm interested to know why some people don't like it. Because as I said, working in a board game shop, I like recommending different games and understanding why someone might like not like the game. So that always comes in handy as well. The next board game I'm going to be talking about is Mysterion. Um, that's one of my new favorite games this year as well. I know I said that quite a few times just for this review, but it sounded way more complex than it was and I just really enjoy it. So thank you for watching. Let me know what you think of this game and yeah. Bye.